Hey everyone, Mr. O here, uh, back with the Phantom Toll Booth, and yesterday, or the last time you listened, uh, we watched along, listened along, as Milo, Tak, the Humbug, and Alec Biggs, remember the character who is growing down, so he's right now about three feet in the air, three feet off the ground, uh, they encountered a colorful symphony. And in that chapter, we learned that this symphony, or a group of musicians, didn't just, didn't play music, but they actually colored the world. And they performed their instruments and played them, and each instrument added a color to maybe the sunset, or to the grass, or to the color of someone's hair or the color of the ocean, or the sky, whatever it might be. And yet again, our author, Norton Juster, just having a little bit of fun with words. Because the word colorful can mean different things. It can literally mean full of color. Not full of food after Thanksgiving, or after a big meal, but full of colors. You might say that a rainbow is colorful. You might say that um, a Picasso painting is colorful. But it can also mean something else. The word colorful, if I go to my dictionary, this is my handiest tool right now as I'm reading this book because I can't just read a word and think that I know exactly what it means. Because just like Milo, the words have multiple meanings, and Milo doesn't always understand the two or three different meanings of a word. And sometimes I could use some help too, so I'm using my dictionary. So colorful can mean full of color, or it can also mean rich in variety. Rich in variety. Well, if you're rich, if you are rich with something, it means you have a lot of it. And variety is, um, means differences. Um, I think variety and differences should be celebrated. And in a symphony, they truly are. Because a symphony has dozens of different musicians playing different instruments. And those instruments play notes that sound different. A trumpet, C, the note C on a trumpet is going to sound wildly different than the C on a violin and the C on the drum. And so the symphony can be rich in variety and it can play a colorful sound. Or in the case of this area, the forest outside of Dictionopolis, they could also just play colors. And, uh, that so happens to be where chapter 10 left off. Chapter 11, Discord and Din. One by one, the hours passed, and at exactly 5.22, by Tok's very accurate clock, Milo carefully opened one eye, and in a moment, the other. Everything was still purple, dark blue, and black, yet scarcely a minute remained to the long, quiet night. Oh, Milo stretched lazily, rubbed his eyelids, scratched his head, and shivered as a greeting to the early morning mist. I must wait Chroma for the sunrise, he said softly. Then he suddenly wondered what it would be like to lead the orchestra and to color the whole world himself. The idea whirled through his thoughts until he quickly decided that since it couldn't be very difficult, and since they probably all knew what to do by themselves anyway, and since it didn't seem a shame to wake anyone so early, and since it might be his only chance to try, and since the musicians were already poised and ready, he would. But just for a while. And so, as everyone slept peacefully on, Milo St stood on his tiptoes, raised his arms slowly in front of him, and made the slightest movement. 
with his index finger of his right hand. It was now 5.23 a.m. As if understanding his signal perfectly, a single piccolo played a single note, and off in the east, a solitary shaft of cool lemon light flickered across the sky. Milo smiled happily, and then cautiously crooked his finger again. This time, two more piccolos and a flute joined in, and three rays of light danced lightly into view. Then, with both hands, he made a great circular sweep in the air and watched with delight as all the musicians began to play at once. The, chill, the cellos made the hills glow red, and the leaves and grass were tipped with a soft pale green as the violins began their song. Only the bass fiddles rested, while the entire orchestra washed the forest with color. Milo was overjoyed because they were all playing for him, and just the way he should. Won't Chroma be so surprised? he thought, signaling the musicians to stop. I'll wake him now. But instead of stopping, the musicians continued to play, now even louder than before, until each color became more brilliant than Milo thought possible. Milo shielded his eyes with one hand and waved the other desperately but the colors continued to grow brighter and brighter and brighter until even, even more curious things began to happen. As Milo frantically conducted, the sky changed slowly from blue to tan and then to a rich magenta red. Flurries of light green snow began to fall from the sky and the leaves and tree of the trees and bushes turned a vivid orange. All the flowers suddenly turned black. The gray rocks became a lovely soft chartreuse, and even peacefully sleeping talk changed from brown to a magnificent ultramarine. Nothing was the color it should have been, and yet the more he tried to straighten things out, the worse they became. I wish I hadn't started, he thought unhappily as a pale blue blackbird flew by. There, there just doesn't seem to be any stop to them. He tried very hard to do everything just the way Chroma had done, but nothing would work. The musicians played on faster and faster, and the purple sun raced quickly across the sky. In less than a minute, it had set once more in the west, and then without any pause, risen again in the east. The sky was now quite yellow, and the grass a charming shade of lavender. Seven times the sun rose and it almost as quickly disappeared as the colors kept changing. In just a few minutes, a whole week had gone by. At last, the exhausted Milo, afraid to call for help, and on the verge of tears, dropped his hands to his sides. The orchestra stopped. The colors disappeared, and once again, it was night. The time was now. 5.27 a.m. Four minutes had passed. Uh, wake up, everybody! Uh, time for the sunrise! Milo shouted with relief and quickly jumped off the music stand. Oh, what a marvelous rest, said Chroma, striding up to the podium. Feel as though I'd slept for a whole week. My, my. I see we're uh, a little late this morning. I'll have to cut my lunch hour short by five minutes. He tapped for attention, and this time the dawn proceeded perfectly. You did a fine job, he said, patting Milo on the head. Someday I'll let you conduct the orchestra yourself. Tock wagged his tail proudly, but Milo didn't say a word. And to this day, no one knows about the lost week except for the few people who happened to be awake at 523 on that very, very peculiar morning. We'd better get going, said Tok, whose alarm had begun to ring again. 
for there's still a long way to go on our journey. Chroma nodded a fond goodbye as they all started back through the forest. And in honor of the visit, he made all the wildflowers bloom in a breathtaking display. I'm sorry you can't stay longer, said Alex sadly. There's so much more to see in the forest of sight, but I suppose there's a lot to see everywhere. If only you keep your eyes open. Pause. Can you find the forest of sight on your map? If you don't have your map handy, go get it. Pause the video. Pause the video, then go get it. Find the forest of sight so you can see exactly where Milo, Tok, and Humbug are on their way to the castle in the air. Once you find it, resume. They talked for a while, all silent, or they walked for a while, excuse me, all silent in their thoughts, until they reached the car, and Alec drew a fine telescope from his shirt and gifted it to Milo. Carry this with you on your journey, he said softly, for there is much worth noticing that often escapes the eye. Through this telescope, you can see everything from the tender moss in a sidewalk to the glow of the farthest star, and most important of all, you can see things as they really are, not just as they seem to be. It is my gift to you. Milo placed the telescope carefully in the glove compartment and reached up to shake Alec by the hand. Then he stepped on the starter and with his head full of strange new thoughts, drove off to the far end of the forest. The easy rolling countryside now stretched before them in a series of dips and rises that leaped up on one side and on of each crest and slid gently down the other in a way that made stomachs laugh and faces frown. As they topped the brow of the highest hill, a deep valley appeared ahead. The road, finally making up its mind, plummeted down as if anxious to renew acquaintance with the sparkling blue stream that flowed below. When they reached the floor of the valley, the wind grew stronger as it funneled through the rocks, and directly ahead, a bright-colored speck grew larger and larger. It, it, it looks like a wagon, cried Milo excitedly. It is a wagon, seconded Tok, a carnival wagon. And that's exactly what it was. Parked at the side of the road, painted bright red and looking quite deserted. On its side, an enormous white lettering bordered with black was the inscription, Cacophonous A Discord. And below in slightly smaller black letters, bordered in white, said, Doctor of Dissonance. Hmm. Perhaps if someone's at home they might tell us how far we have to go, said Milo, parking next to the wagon. He tiptoed timidly up the three wooden steps to the door, tapped lightly, and leaped back in fright. For the moment he knocked, there was a terrible crash inside the wagon that sounded as if a whole set of dishes had been dropped from the ceiling onto a hard stone floor. At the same time, the door flew open, and from the dark interior, a hoarse voice inquired, Have you ever heard a whole set of dishes drop from the ceiling onto a hard stone floor? Milo, who had tumbled back off the steps, sat up quickly, while Tok and Humbug rushed from the car to see what had happened. Well, have you? insisted the voice, which was so raspy it made you want to clear your own throat. Uh, not until just now, replied Milo, getting to his feet. Ha! I thought not, said the voice happily. Have you ever heard an ant wearing fur slippers walk across a thick wool carpet? And before they could answer, he went on in this his strange croaking way. Well, don't just stand there in the cold. Come in, come in. It's lucky you happened by. None of you looks very well. The faint glow of a ceiling lamp dimly illuminated the wagon as they cautiously stepped inside. 
Talk first, eager to defend against all danger. Milo next, frightened, but curious. And the humbug last, ready at any moment to run for his life. That's right. Now let's have a look at you, he said. T -t -t -t. Very bad. Very bad indeed. A serious case. The dusty wagon was lined with shelves full of curious boxes and jars of a kind found in an old apothecary shop. It looked as though it hadn't been swept in years. Bits and pieces of equipment lay strewn all over the floor, and at the rear was a heavy wooden table covered with books, bottles, and bric-a-brac. Have you ever heard a blindfolded octopus unwrap a cellophane-covered bathtub? He inquired again as the air was filled with a loud, crinkling, snapping sound. Sitting at the table, busily mixing and measuring, was the man who had invited them inside. He was wearing a long white coat with a stethoscope around his neck and a small round mirror attached to his forehead. And the only really noticeable things about him were his tiny mustache and his enormous ears, each of which was easily as large as his head. Um, are you a doctor? Asked Milo, trying to feel as well as possible. Am I am I am Cacophonous A Discord Doctor of Dissonance roared the man, and as he spoke, several small explosions and a grinding crash were heard. What does the A stand for? stammered the nervous bug, too frightened to move. As loud as possible bellowed the doctor and two screeches and a bump accompanied his response. Now, step a little closer and uh, stick out your tongues. Ugh, oh, just as I suspected, he continued, opening a large dusty book and thumbing through the pages. You're suffering from a severe lack of noise. He began to jump around the wagon, snatching bottles from the shelves until he had a large assortment in various colors and sizes collected at one, den one end of the table. All were neatly labeled. Loud cries, soft cries, bangs, bongs, smashes, crashes, swishes, swooshes, snaps and crackles, whistles and gongs, squeaks, squawks, and miscellaneous uproar. After pouring a little of each into a large glass beaker, he stirred the mixture thoroughly with a wooden spoon, watching intently as it smoked and steamed and boiled and bubbled. Be ready in a moment, he explained, rubbing his hands. Milo had never seen such unpleasant-looking medicine, and he was not anxious to try any. Um... Just what kind of doctor are you? Milo asked suspiciously. Well, you might say I'm a, I'm a specialist, said the doctor. I specialize in noise, all kinds of noise, from the loudest to the softest. From the slightly annoying to the terribly unpleasant. For instance... Have you heard a square-wheeled steamroller ride over a street full of hard-boiled eggs? He asked, and as he did, all that could be heard were loud, crunching sounds. But who would want to hear all those terrible noises? Asked Milo, holding his ears. Everybody, said the surprised doctor. They're very popular today. Why, I'm kept so busy I can hardly fill the orders for noise pills, racket lotion, clamor salva, and hubbub tonic. That's all people seem to want these days. He stirred the beaker of liquid a few more times, and then, as the steam cleared, continued, Business was not always so good. Years ago, everyone wanted pleasant sounds, and except for a few orders during wars and earthquakes... Things were awful. But then, 
the big cities were built, and there was a great need for honking horns, screeching trains, clanging bells, deafening shouts, piercing shrieks, gurgling drains, and all the rest of those wonderfully unpleasant sounds we use so much today. Without them, people would be very unhappy. So I make sure that they get as much as they want. Why, if you take a little of my medicine every day, you'll never have to hear a beautiful sound again. Here, try some. If it's all the same to you, I'd rather not, said the humbug, <clears throat> backing away to the far corner of the wagon. I don't want to be cured of beautiful sounds, insisted Milo. Besides, growled Tock, who decided he didn't much like Dr. Discord. There's no such illness as lack of noise. Of course not, replied the doctor, pouring himself a small glass of the liquid. That's what makes it so difficult to cure. I only treat illnesses that don't exist. That way, if I can't cure them, no harm done. Just one of the precautions of the trade, you know he concluded, and seeing that no one was about to take his medicine, he again reached toward the shelf, removed a dark amber bottle, dusted it carefully, and placed it on the table in front of him. Very well. If you want to go all through life suffering from a noise deficiency, I'll give it to the din for his lunch, he said, and he uncorked the bottle with a hollow popping sound. For a moment, everything was quiet as Milo, Talk, and the humbug looked intently at that bottle, wondering what Dr. Discord would do next. Then, very faintly at first, they heard a low rumbling that sounded miles away. It grew louder and louder and louder and closer and closer until it became a deafening, ear-splitting roar that seemed to be coming from inside the tiny bottle. Then, from the bottle, a thick bluish smog spiraled to the ceiling, spread out, and gradually assumed the shape <coughs> of a thick bluish smog with hands, feet, bright yellow eyes, and a large frowning mouth. As soon as the smog had gotten completely out of the bottle, it grasped the beaker of liquid, tilted back what would have been its head, and if it really had one, and drank it all in three gulps. Ah, that was good, master, he bellowed, shaking the whole wagon. I thought you'd never let me out. Terribly cramped in there. This is my assistant, the awful Din, said Dr. Discord. You must forgive his appearance, for he really doesn't have any. You see, he is an orphan whom I raised myself without benefit of help or any other assistance for. No nurse is good nurse, interrupted the din, doubling up with laughter. If you can imagine a thick, bluish cloud of smoke doubling up with laughter. For I found him, continued the doctor, ignoring this outburst, living alone and unwanted in an abandoned soda bottle without family or relatives. No niece is good niece roared the din again, again, with a laugh that sounded like several sirens going off at once, and he slapped at where his knee would have been. And I brought him here, continued the exas exasperated discord, where, despite his lack of shape or features, I trained. No nose is good nose, thundered the din once again as he collapsed in another fit of laughter, clutching his sides. I trained him as my assistant in the business of concocting and dispensing noise, finished the doctor, mopping his brow with a handkerchief. No noise is good noise, exclaimed the, humbu exclaimed the humbug, happily trying to catch the spirit of things. That's not funny at all, sobbed the din, who went to a corner and sulked. What is a din? asked Milo, when he had recovered from the shock of the uproar. You mean you've never met the awful Din? said Dr. Discord in a surprised tone. 
Why, I thought everyone had. When you're playing in your room and you make a great amount of noise, <coughs> what do they tell you to stop? That awful din, admitted Milo. When the neighbors are playing their radio too loud late at night, what do you wish they'd turn down? That awful din, answered Tuck. When the street on your block is being repaired and the pneumatic drills are working all day, what does everyone complain of? Oh, that dreadful row, volunteered the humbug brightly. The dreadful row, cried the anguished din, was my grandfather. He perished in the great silence pandemic of 1712. Milo felt sorry for the unhappy Din that he gave him his handkerchief, which was immediately covered in bluish, smogish tears. Thank you, groaned the Din. That's very kind, but I certainly can't understand why you don't like noise, he said. Why, I heard an explosion last week that was so lovely I cried for two days. The very thought of it upset him so much he began to sob all over again in a way that sounded almost exactly like a handful of fingernails scratched across a mile-long chalkboard. He buried his head in the doctor's lap. He's very sensitive, isn't he? asked Milo, trying to comfort the emotional din. It's true, agreed Dis Dr. Discord. But he's right, you know? For noise is the most valuable thing in the world. <coughs> King Azia Z says words are, said Milo. Nonsense, the doctor roared. Why, when a baby wants food, how does he ask? He screams, answered the din, looking up happily. And when an automobile wants gas, it chokes, he shouted again, jumping for joy. When a river wants water, what does it do? It creaks bellowed the din as he collapsed into a fit of uncontrollable laughter. And what happens when a new day begins? <clears throat> it breaks! He gasped joyfully from the floor, a look of utter bliss covering his face. You see how simple it is? The doctor said to Milo, who didn't understand at all. And then, turning to the tear-stained, tear smiling din, doctor remarked, isn't it time for you to go? Where to? Asked Milo. Perhaps we're going the same way. I think not, the din replied, picking up an armful of empty sacks from the table. For I'm going on my noise collection rounds. You see, once a day, I travel throughout the kingdom and I collect all the wonderfully horrible and beautifully unpleasant noises that have been made. I pack them into my sacks and I bring them back here for the doc to make his medicines from. And he does a good job, said Dr. Discord, pounding his fist on the table. So, wherever the noise is, that's where you'll find me, said the din with an appreciative smile. And I must hurry along, for I understand that today there is to be a screech, several loud crashes, and a bit of pandemonium. And in which direction are you going? asked the doctor, mixing together another brew. <coughs> to Digitopolis, replied Milo. How unfortunate, he said as the din shuffled toward the door. How very unfortunate, for then you must pass through the Valley of Sound. Is that bad? asked the perpetually worried humbug. The din paused in the doorway with a look of extreme horror on his almost featureless face. And the doctor shuddered in a way that sounded very much like a fast-moving freight train being derailed into a mountain of yogurt. Well, you might ask, for you will very soon find out, was all he, sa all he would say as he sadly bade them farewell, farewell and the din galloped off on his noise collecting rounds. <clears throat> Whew, my throat is scratchy after doing that Dr. Discord. <clears throat> so Discord <clears throat> is a word you might not have heard before, but the root of it, the base, is a word you maybe have heard. 
chord. Chord. Maybe you've heard that word in music. A chord in music is three or more notes that when played together sound in harmony, make a beautiful, pleasant sound. But when you add the prefix dis, dis, to chord, it means not pleasant sounding. A chord is pleasant sounding. The prefix dis means not or not any. So discord is when there are not or not any harmonious things. And harmony is when things work together to create something beautiful. So I think there's a lot of nat I think there's a lot of harmony in nature. Things work together and create beauty and in working together they give a little and take a little, kind of like the universe in our born with a bang story. And I think it's kind of fun when you think of that harmony being all mixed up and jumbled. So, <clears throat> I made <clears throat> my discordant plant. My, sorry, <laughs> my, dis, my discordant plant. So, prefix D-I-S means not. So this means my not harmonious plant. So here I've drawn my sun and my grass and soil layer. And first, of course, I have my primary root growing up towards the sun. Because this, of course, is not a plant that's in harmony. It's a plant in discord. And, you know, off this primary root, I have a secondary root with some root hairs and a flower growing off that root. And then over here I have a stem with a leaf on it. Oh, and you know, a worm all the way up on the top of my plant. And then below ground, I have my stem growing with a bunch of root hairs on it and a root growing down with a beautiful flower growing off that root underground, of course. And then here I have a ruby-throated hummingbird underground collecting the nectar from my out of harmony or discordant plant. Now, I encourage you to think of something that normally is in harmony and its parts are where they belong and they work together to create something um, like a plant and have a little fun with it. Think about the parts of it and then jumble it up. Put them in the places you wouldn't expect. Have some fun with it. You don't have to do a plant if you don't like. That's why I put this little blank here. So when you do this activity, you can call it my discordant fill in the blank. If you enjoy this work and you're proud of it, take a picture or take a video pointing out and explaining it like, like I just did and send it to me. I love seeing your work so very much. Until next time.